Greetings all, you're back. Uh, this time we're going to talk about uh, how we can kind of put some of what we've already learned into practice and how we can create some new behaviors and uh, change some existing ones and kind of tweak them a little bit. Uh, first, I'm going to have a little bit of coffee as I look at that nice discriminative stimulus on my desk. The question is which one's warm? Mm. Here we go. Well, that's kind of cheesy. You can see it. Do I even need to describe it? Take a look at what's on there. I mean, if we were to if we were to describe that, how would you describe it? I mean, you're starting with a star and you're ending with a circle, right? So if we were to describe that process of change, you're slowly changing one stimulus into another, right? Uh, so essentially, that's all we're going to do. We're going to take one stimulus and we're going to change it into another one. And that stimulus can be all sorts of things. So let's take a look a little further. All right, so gradual change of a stimulus over successive trials. Right. So right off the bat, you should see a couple of things. Number one, we're not going to make gigantic changes here. Um, and then number two, what we're going to do is do this repeatedly, okay, the over and over and over again. That's the successive trials part. Right. From an exist existing discriminative stimulus to a different discriminative stimulus, right, you're going to produce the same response. So the idea is here, you're trying to teach somebody to do something. Right? Uh, and they're already engaging in the, in the behavior that you want, but they're engaging in it at the wrong time. Or they're engaging in it um, in one scenario but not another, and you're trying to get them to engage in that scenario. I've got a bunch of examples um, on the next slide, and we'll look at those here in a minute. But the basic idea is, or the, the, one of the basic applications is if, you know, oftentimes we're trying to get autistic kids to respond appropriately to particular stimuli. We want those stimuli to be realistic, things in the normal environment. Your book uses a good example about, uh, say, look, like, look at me, I think is what the book uh, does. Or, oh, I think the book says, what's your name, right? Um, so the child might be able to describe what's his name, say what his name is or her name is in one context, but not be able to answer the question. So what we have to do with one of the procedures we could use is fading to address that particular thing. Okay. Ultimately, what we're talking about is transferring the control. So we have one discriminative stimulus that has stimulus control over behavior. Now we're going to transfer that stimulus control from, from the original SD to a new one. Right. Typically speaking, we're going to focus on one dimension of the stimulus. Shape, color, you know, that type of thing, right? Size. You know, pattern, blah, 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 right? And we're going to slowly change that dimension. Right? Uh, we can do auditory stuff as well, you know, learning to discriminate uh, fine details and music stuff is, is partially a fading process. And there's all sorts of things that where fading plays a role. So let's look at a couple of those, uh, a couple of those settings here after we get done with this slide, right? But you can also fade across settings. So in other words, teaching somebody to engage in a you know, somebody's engaging in a particular behavior at home, but they're not doing it at school, so you could fade out that home to school. And that's a pretty big fade that you would have to do, but you could make some things similar. You could have a, a verbal cue at home or a visual cue at home, and then you could bring that visual cue to school and slowly fade that visual cue out. Maybe just a little piece of paper or a, a wristband or something. Who knows? So let's look at some examples of fading. <laughs> 